This is the second lecture in a series with this title, The Oneness of God and the Diversity of Religions. A number of you were here, many of you were here last week for the Hindu perspective that was uh, delivered, the lecture that was delivered by Dr. Anantanan Rambachan. And now we uh, are having our second lecture today, and it's a, a great pleasure and honor for me to welcome here uh, Dr. Rahul Deep Singh Gill. I'll introduce him in just a second, but I just want to say uh, something else about the series. Those of you who are here heard me say that actually this series is marking the 50th anniversary of a publication back in 1966 of one of the real turning point articles in the history of interfaith relations. This came from Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel, who wrote an article called No Religion is an Island. It was published in, Union Theolo in the Union Seminary Quarterly Review back in 1966. And I thought, you know, that article had such an influence uh, in the field of interfaith relations that I wanted to uh, have a commemoration or mark its anniversary. In that article, uh, Heschel, who as a Jew, as a rabbi, um, was deeply committed to the idea of the oneness of God, nonetheless said that he also believed that it was God's will that there be diverse religions, that diversity of religion is the will of God. And that, of course, ran contrary to what an awful lot of people in 1966 and maybe even today believe. So many people in a number of different faiths, not Sikhism as, as you will hear, uh, tend to believe that you know there's one way to God. That's certainly something we've heard you know, within the Christian traditions over and over. However, of course, there are a number of churches who have, like, our, like the Catholic Church, who, uh, that have uh, issued documents claim that they, claiming that uh, nothing that is true and holy in other religions, that they, they accept whatever is true and holy in other religions. And um, so the Catholic position today, as the position of a number of Protestant churches, is uh, similar to Heschel's view um, that he articulated 50 years ago. And of course, the Jewish community seems to have embraced this view of Heschel's, and, and Heschel even defended that particular perspective by rooting it in his understanding of the rabbinic tradition, interpreting the rabbinic tradition. In any case, what I decided to do was invite people from a number of traditions. So first Hinduism, now uh, Sikhism. Next semester, we will have lectures by uh, a Muslim scholar and a Christian scholar. And then we'll conclude the series a year from now in October of um, 2017 with someone from Heschel's faith tradition, the Jewish tradition, on that very theme 50 years later. So it's my great pleasure, and as I, I mentioned, it's an honor for me to uh, welcome Rahul Deep, Dr. Rahul Deep Singh Gill here. He was born in the Punjab in India, but raised in Boston, and now is a professor at California Lutheran University. So he and his wife and children live in Los Angeles. And uh, at California uh, Lutheran University, he, direct, he has directed the Center for Equality and Justice, and he is, I see it's up here, the Campus Interface Strategist. And he's twice been voted Cal Lutheran's Diversity Professor of the Year. Um, he also uh, serves from time to time as visiting professor of, I'm saying Sikh, I just got into the habit of that, you say Sikh, uh, so I'll, I'll adapt to that. Um, but uh, he's, been, he's the visiting professor of Sikh studies at Graduate Theological Union in Berkeley. He received his MA and his PhD degrees in religious studies at, at, at the University of California, uh, Santa Barbara. Um, by the way, did I say Graduate Theological Union? That's what I meant to say, where you do the, your visiting professor uh, teaching. 
actually, uh, Rahul Deep is a very widely sought after uh, lecturer, and most often, or at least much of the time, he gives lectures and workshops that have to do with creating more inclusive environments in the workplace, in the marketplace, um, and in other kinds of communities, like campus communities. And this morning, we had a presentation by him, a very enlightening and engaging presentation on uh, diversity at St. Thomas and you know pluralism at St. Thomas and what we can do to make this, uh, this a more welcoming campus um, and a more diverse and pluralistic campus. Um, the Los Angeles Times and um, the Washington Post uh, have published some of his writings and he blogs at the Huffington Post. Oxford University Press is about to release in the next week or so, is it? Um, his first book called Drinking from Love's Cup, Surrender and Sacrifice in the Vars of Baha'i Gurdas. Did I say that okay? And the Vars are the, uh, the ballads. And he is working on a second book that I'm looking forward to called Pluralists, Great Leaders in, the history, in History Who Brought People Together. And now I introduce to you a wonderful leader who is bringing people together, Dr. Rahul Deep Singh Gill. Thank you. That's really kind of you. Thank you, John. Thank you. That was a really great introduction, John. I really appreciate th that. Thank you so much. It's great to be here in Minnesota and uh, really appreciate Hans and John bringing me out here. Really love this state. Uh, very diverse state uh, on its own. The Twin Cities are an amazing place and it's a treat to, to be here with you all. So there was a question about how to pronounce the word. Now if I say uh, sick, uh, I say it with a hard K at the end, right? So it's an aspirated K, like you're gonna spit in somebody's eye. Uh, sick, uh, if you say it with a non-aspirated K, it sounds like you know, you're talking about people who need aspirin and cold compression. But that's okay, uh, it's a short I uh, in that there. So it's a sick perspective. I want to make sure that you know that this is a sick perspective on uh, the oneness of God and the diversity of religions. Uh, I cannot speak for my entire tradition. They probably don't want me to anyways. I'm a little bit of a rabble rouser in that tradition. Uh, I stand uh, and push the tradition farther uh, than it might want to go sometimes. But that's OK with me. But I still want you to know that this is my perspective on the oneness of God and the diversity of religions. So what are we going to cover today? Uh, any talk that I give to a, a non-Sikh audience on the Sikh tradition is going to require a brief introduction to the tradition. right? And so somehow in uh, 35 minutes, I'm going to give that and briefly touch on Heschel's main points while introducing Sikh sources. And here in particular, we're going to talk about the sources of Guru Nanak, the founder of the Sikh tradition, that support Heschel's points. But also, I want to push back a little bit and say that the Sikh perspective, unique as it is, has some things to say um, to that would challenge. Uh, Heschel's perspective. Finally, at the end, like my students want me to, you know, just give me the answer, Professor Gill. <laughs> Fine, I'll do that, and I'll give you my thoughts and conclude uh, the, the discussion. Does that sound like a good plan for you? So let's jump into this with a brief introduction to the Sikh tradition, right? Uh, did you know that the Prime Minister of India before the one now was a Sikh? He's the one in the turban uh, on this side of the screen. Uh, his name was Manmohan Singh. Um, if you've seen Bend It Like Beckham, who's, who's seen Bend It Like Beckham? That's about a, a Sikh uh, family in the UK. They're actually twice migrants. They migrated to East Africa. And then when Idi Amin came into power, they moved to uh, the UK. Uh, so this is Barminder Nagra, who was also on ER. The, f the f movie was made by another sick woman, Gurinder Chadda, who uh, has made a lot of really big movies, 
She has a big personality and she doesn't pull any punches. That's a very sick thing to do. Did you know that the first Asian congressperson in America was named Dalip Singh Song, was born in the Punjab, and was a Sikh. He uh, graduated with his doctorate from the University of California at Berkeley in uh, 1929. When his country allowed him to, he became a citizen in 1949, ran for office the next year, won. Uh, he ran for uh, justice of the peace. But they said, oh, no, it's too soon. The law has just changed. Yeah, you're a citizen, but you can't be justice of the peace. He said, fine. He ran again, won again. <laughs> they called him Judge Sound. And in the 1950s, Dalip Singh Sound ran for and was elected to Congress to serve the Imperial Valley of Southern California. Uh, this is him with a couple important presidents at that time vice president. And he played a, a great role as an ambassador to Asia for America at the beginning of the Cold War. So Dalip Singh Sand is a, is, a, is a hero of mine. Uh, did you know that uh, the governor of South Carolina was born a Sikh into a Sikh family? She was born Namrita Kaur Randhawa. Her name now is Governor Nikki Haley of South Carolina, a very important figure in the Republican Party. This is her in the Punjab visiting the holiest Sikh shrine, the Darbar Sahib, the holy court in Amritsar, our Mecca, our Vatican. And she had a very emotional moment as she was uh, talking about her experience there right at that holy temple. And it's on YouTube. And it's an amazing thing to watch for her to be asked questions and, and just be overwhelmed with emotion about her heritage. Now, before I come into a room and talk about Sikhism, most people already have some idea about Sikhism. Oftentimes, it's the wrong idea, right? So let's clear up some misconceptions about the Sikh traditions. The first misconception that is common is that the Sikh tradition has something to do uh, with Hinduism or as an offshoot of the Hindu religion. Another misconception that is a lot more recent and comes out in the West is that these people with turbans are Muslim. A third misconception is that Sikhism is some kind of magical combination of Hinduism and Islam as if religions were just paints that if you could take one color and mix it with another, voila, you have a third and new option. That's not how it works. Okay, So Sikhs are not Hindus. Sikhs are not Muslims, and Sikh tradition is not a combination of Hinduism and Islam. Now, the part about Sikhs are not Muslims is a troubling one for me. That is something that Sikhs have been saying in the last 15 or so years because uh, of the hate crimes that have sprung up uh, after 9-11. I don't like to say that Sikhs are not Muslims if, because my favorite athlete was Muhammad Ali. My favorite poet is Rumi. So in my heart, maybe I am part Muslim, and if you want to come after me, go for it. But the best statement that I've heard on this issue is from a Sikh rapper named Humble the Poet. You can go to his website, check him out. He says in an Instagram uh, post, the problem isn't that you're mistaking me of someone for, uh, of Islamic faith. The problem is that you think there's a problem with that. So Sikhs are not Muslim. That's a religious designation. As far as a social political designation, by all intents and purposes, I'm happy to stand with my Muslim brothers and sisters in this crazy world that we live in. So what, OK, that's what Sikhism is not. So what is Sikhism? So let me share some basic ideas with you. Sikhs believe in monotheism. So that's the first question. The oneness of God, we got that. Check. Okay? Six are uh, monotheists who believe in a singular God that is the source of all things in the world. That God cannot be fully known to us. That God is paradoxically fully here and fully other from this world. I don't know how to explain that in 35 minutes to you, but maybe in question and answers we can knock that one out. 
God works uh, in Sikh history through 10 founders, the first of whom received a revelation uh, from God, which becomes the source of uh, Sikh uh, scripture or the word and builds a community, Sangat or Panth, uh, a people around that scripture, around those teachings of monotheism, of ethical living, of the absolute equality of all people, men and women, rich and poor, high and low before God. So those are the basic foundational ideas of Sikhism, God, Guru, the community, and the word. This um, scripture of ours, this Barney, this Guru Granth Sahib, which means the holy book, that is the Guru, after the ten founders, I'll tell you about how the book became the Guru, became the inspiration for six today, contains the scriptural revelations in poetry form of six of the ten Sikh Gurus. It also contains the writings of several Sikh followers of those gurus who wrote in praise of those gurus and wrote about events that were happening during the period in which the gurus were alive. Guru in Indian languages uh, means teacher. It means divine teacher, somebody who takes you from darkness to light, somebody who shows you the light. But Sikh tradition, Sikh scripture contains one more set of uh, poems, and that is poems from Hindu poets and Muslim poets. Poets who were high caste, poets who were outcast, who couldn't eat with other people not of their caste, who if they were seen walking around would be polluting to people of high caste. The Sikh tradition includes the poetry of all of these different groups. That poetry was selected to align with Sikh theology, so it wasn't anything goes. But Sikhs believe that if other people are inspired to see the monotheism uh, of God and to live life in an ethical way totally devoted to community and the divine, that uh, their contribution can be included in the scripture. So some people like to say the Sikh scripture is the world's first interfaith scripture. I don't know how far that is true, but 1,430 pages of Sikhs, Muslims, Hindus, outcasts, their poetry, and their divine, uh, divinely inspired hymns in this scripture. So a lot of people go to theology when they want to understand things about religion. With all due respect to the theology departments that are represented in this room, um, I say no. I say let's understand these funny people from the ground up. Let's understand them uh, from the geographical perspective. That will help us understand what they believe and what they practice a lot more fundamentally, okay? So when we're talking about the roots of the Sikh tradition, we're talking about a region known as the Punjab. Panj in Farsi, uh, which is Persian, which comes from not India, but all the way over here. Oh my, it's a little weak, right? Panj means, is Persian for the number <laughs> Thank you. Pop quiz. You didn't know it was coming. <laughs> Number five. Ab means waters. So the land of the five rivers is the Punjab. Today it is a land that is divided between Pakistan and India. Um, this is the, the uh, historical Punjab. As you can see, it, there it is in close up, divided between these two great nations. Geographically, maybe from God's perspective, or at least the satellite's perspective, this is what Punjab looks like. It's the area in that red square there. All right, so what would you expect about that area in that red square, knowing the geography around it? Any takers? What could you think about that area? What might be true about that area? What might you guess about the region? Farming. Why would you say farming? Yeah, these are all highlands. 
These are lowlands. It looks green, and you've got rivers running through it. Now, where do the rivers come from? The snow from the mountains, every year when it melts, not only does it bring the waters down, but it brings a little millimeter of really fertile silt called alluvium, alluvium that washes over uh, the land and creates some of the most uh, gorgeous and fertile land for our agriculture uh, in the world. And it also, if you go back to these slides, right, this area over here, these mountains, these are the passes that separate, in some sense, the Western world from the East. Central Asia from South Asia. And so these are the five rivers of Punjab. Now, if you counted them, you might say these Punjabis, they're not so good at counting because I see six rivers. That is possible. It might be because they named it for the five big rivers. They might have named it for the five uh, because the word five means a lot. Or they might have been talking about the land between the rivers, which is five, the five lands between the rivers. I don't know. But these are the rivers of the Punjab. It is a very agriculturally robust area. It is an area that connects Central Asia and South Asia. Um, and it is an area where immense trade uh, would have passed through at certain times in history. So what do Sikhs do? What is the Sikh way of life? The Sikh way of life, I would say, is rooted in prayer based on the Guru Granth Sahib, that scriptural volume of 1,430 pages. It is based in a life of devotion to God, Vaheguru, and to the ways of ethical living prescribed in the Guru Granth Sahib, which, I, as I said before, are about the oneness of all humanity, the equality of all people, uh, the importance of um, ethical living. Um, living ethics is more important to Sikhs than theology, I would say. Because we can believe different things about God, but ultimately God is beyond comprehension. God is beyond words. God is beyond genders, right? Poetry is a great way to get at that because it's interpretive, it's fluid, it's rhythmic, it's musical. Um, but ultimately for six, to be a good Sikh, one must live a Sikh life. One must live a good life, a fair life, a just life. And that is nowhere more um, importantly lived out than in service. The Sikh word for service can also uh, have a root that sounds like attendance, attending. You know how like somebody's servants can be their attendant? We pay attention. So for me, the, the, the focus on service is not just a focus on, uh, you know, cleaning up, uh, washing, cleaning, feeding. It's a focus on paying attention to the world around you and paying attention to the divine spark inside of you and the divine spark inside even your enemy. It's attending to. So to go a little bit deep into Sikh history, this is a picture of the Guru Granth Sahib at the most important Sikh shrine that I mentioned a little bit earlier where we saw Namrathaka Randawa, a.k.a. Nikki Haley, crying. This is a picture from the second story of that temple, looking down over into the Guru Granth Sahib, which is here, but covered in beautiful cloth and flowers, sitting there as in the place of who the living Guru would have been, who the living, where the living Guru would have been sitting uh, in the time when the Gurus were alive, which is between 1469 and 1708. 1469, right? Columbus is getting ready to sail the ocean blue. Uh, during Guru Nanak's lifetime, Martin Luther has his great reformation. In India, we have this man Nanak, who comes from the Bedi clan, which is a somewhat of a high caste mercantile clan. They live amongst farming people, and Guru Nanak has this revelation 
the stories which we don't worship but we read as, as information about the, the early days of the guru. The stories say that he was a beloved worker in this town called Sultanpur and he went missing. For three days, people thought he drowned. They dredged the river, is that the right word? They, and they couldn't find him until he showed up one day and people were shocked to see him and the story goes he was silent he said nothing he said nothing for a long time but when they finally got him to talk he said there is no hindu there is no muslim those were his first words after what he later describes as a divine experience he says that he had an experience with god's presence going to the divine court, which is how six see heaven, is that God is the sovereign at the center and everyone is attending to God uh, around them. As part of uh, this revelation uh, and his mystical proclivities, people call him Baba, which means father. Sounds like Abba in the Bible and all kinds of other uh, Western words for father. And Guru, which means holy teacher. Now, he wasn't just a holy man, he was also a great um, uh, innovator, a, a great leader who founds his own town, right? Mystical people, people with an eye just in the sky, they don't found their own town. They don't start farming communities around them. Um, he was also an institution builder. So he founds a town towards the end of his life called Kartharpur. He passes his office on at the time of his death to a successor, which tells us what? He wanted his religion, his tradition to continue. He passes it on by handing over his book of poetry over to his successor. So the scripture is sort of part of the guruship at that point, right? The scripture, his poems, become part of the succession of Sikh life. And then we just talked about the inclusiveness of Sikh scripture. It not only includes the poems of, the seven, of six of the gurus, but also the poetry of six, also the poetry of um, some Muslims and some Hindus who wrote in languages of the northern Indian uh, dialect. Now, why do these guys run around with all their funny turbans and their beards? Well, at the end of the guru period, which is at 1708, the last final living guru uh, decides that he is going to um, start a ceremony where people are um, showing their devotion to the tradition in terms of their readiness to die for the tradition. Now why do they get so much like that, so violent? The fifth guru and the ninth guru, the father of, of this man, are both executed by the Mughal emperor. So my book, Drinking from Love's Cup, is about the theme of sacrifice in the Sikh tradition that comes out of those martyrdoms. And Sikhism has to adapt pretty quickly, and it takes this spirit of devotion and service, and it adds a layer of militarism for self-protection. At the final stage of this transition, Guru Gobind Singh, the 10th guru, the final guru, elevates the entire community, he says, to the sovereign community. There is no middleman, he says, between the community and God. He himself bows down to the community and elevates the entire community to guru. So today, we have the guru in the form of scripture and the guru in the form of the body of the Khalsa, the body of the Sikh community. So the guruship is not any living person today. It's the inspiration for living in the word, in the scripture, and it's the people who live that out, the Khalsa. M my middle name is Singh. My daughter's middle name is Gar. That comes from uh, this period where Sikhs uh, took on the name lion for men and princess for women as a part of this transition to the Khalsa. What is this? What is this guy doing? 
that is a cauldron. That is a massive wok, right? That is a massive iron um, bowl on which is being heated on a huge fire. In Punjabi, we call that deg. Deg means a massive bowl where you, in which you cook lentils. <laughs> and he's cooking lentils, this, this old man. He's stirring the pot uh, of a soup, a lentil soup, dal, if anyone has been to an Indian restaurant. Uh, in every Sikh house of worship, you're going to find a langar, a place where anybody can come and have a meal. And the Sikh um, motto today is victory for the cauldron and the sword. Deg, deg, fateh. Fateh is a Persian word meaning victory. And so Sikhs, their motto is to call for the victory of the cauldron and the sword. The way that I interpret that is that the sword, the militaristic values of the Sikh tradition, are there for the self-protection of the community so that it can perpetuate the feeding of all people. Service to the world in the form of the cauldron, in the form of the kitchen, in the form of the lunger, which is both the kitchen and the meal that is served out of that kitchen, which is vegetarian. So people who eat pork, don't eat pork or don't eat beef, right, or don't eat cheese on their hamburgers, right, can, can, can all be accommodated. Vegans, sorry, these people love cows and butter and milk. <laughs> so the vegan thing is something we're going to need to adapt to. But in terms of vegetarianism, the Sikh lunger is always vegetarian. I'm not a vegetarian. Most Sikhs I know are not vegetarians. There isn't that necessarily dietary restriction. But it's a vegetarian meal so that all people can partake in it. Sikhs have a long history, more than a 100-year history in America. This is the first Sikh temple, Gurdwara in Stockton, California. These men came over as uh, farmers, steel mill workers, railroad track layers. Uh, in those days of deep, deep white supremacy, they weren't allowed to bring wives over. Some of them married Catholic Mexican women. Um, when laws were loosened, they did bring their wives over, and the six central, the, the California Central Valley, up and down Route 99, if you look at your maps, is um, deeply, deeply populated by sick farmers, some of whom are the raisin kings of America and the almond growers, right, association of, of America. So, no religion is an island. Heschel doesn't mention the Sikh tradition, but can we make sense of the Sikh tradition in the context of what Heschel does argue in this seminal article that John uh, introduced us to at the, at the beginning of the talk? Let me just give you my rendition of some of the main points of that article. I think the first main point that Heschel is trying to make in that article is that we exist in a wor cosmic world historical moment. Something is happening. The Holocaust, the Shoah, has just happened. America is in the middle of a terrible war, the Vietnam War. More and more people are in contact with each other than ever before and probably know less about each other than ever before, simultaneously, somehow. So Heschel says, that some of us are like patients in a state of final agony who scream in delirium when the doc that the doctor is dead. The doctor is dead. There is an urgency to Heschel's moment that he perceives and feels in this time that he's living in. In the Shoah, a lot has been lost. In the Holocaust, a lot has been lost. What has been lost? The divine image of so many human beings. Because he believes that every human being is an image of the divine. What else is lost? Many people's faith in the God of justice and compassion. What else is lost? The secret power of attachment to the Bible that has over 3,000 years of history and tradition attached to it. So Heschel, as uh, 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 an Orthodox Jew who is deeply interested in questions of living together and mysticism and experience of the divine is asking these really, really deep questions. And he's also asking 
what to do with this now. What to do in this moment when people, he says man, I apologize, not my choice of words, um, no longer feel connected to something greater than them. No longer feel that they live in a world full of magic and unseen meaning that they can tap into. Is it not our duty, Heschel asks, to help one another in trying to overcome hardness of heart and cultivating a sense of wonder and mystery? And Heschel concludes that in this time, no religion can have a monopoly on what he calls holiness. Uh, he says, wherever a deed is done in accord with the will of God, wherever a thought of man is directed toward him, there is the holy. This is him walking, marching with Martin Luther King on a Sabbath day when other rabbis criticized him for doing work on the Sabbath, for engaging in this way on the Sabbath when it was time for prayer. You know what Heschel said? Felt like my feet were praying when he was marching for civil rights with Dr. King. So Heschel writes this article um, to inquire how a Jew out of his commitment and a Christian out of his commitment can find a religious basis for communication and cooperation on matters relevant to their moral and spiritual concern in spite of disagreement. So that's my take on Heschel's article. Does the Sikh tradition support this view? Your guess would be maybe, yes. So here is my translation of one of the verses of Guru Nanak. The, the line in the italics, these are both refrain lines. Uh, I really wanted you to pay attention to the line in orange, but let's read the whole thing. So this is how it looks. This is uh, an English rendition of the Punjabi. The one, and I don't gender God when I translate, uh, when I refer to God as the one. The one cannot be deceived, nor is there a knife to wound the one. I remain as the sovereign keeps me, a miser, while my soul writhes about. The question is, how can a candle burn without oil? Live by the sacred books to twist fear of God into this body. When we are lit, we understand the everlasting. This is how a candle burns without oil, for the light is the light of the sovereign. Words have pierced my body. I find peace when I live to serve, though the world is caught in its cycle. If we live to serve in this world, then we find a seat at the court and go with our arms swinging, says Donnick. So, Heschel would read this and be very excited, I think. Right? Any quick reflections or questions on this? Uh, what do you see uh, happening here? Do you see, understand the metaphor of twisting? What is being twisted there? A wick? A cotton wick in a clay candle that can be lit? Our bodies are the candle. We are the candle that is lit without oil. We are the candle that is lit with divine inspiration. We can l be lit to serve in this world. Here's another composition. Whatever the Almighty shall please, whatever the Almighty, whatever pleases the Almighty shall come to be. The world is a device for that. Now previously he said that let us live by the sacred books. And here he's talking about the sacred books of religions before him. He's not talking about the six sacred books necessarily. He sees the divine revelation as a constant process in human history. And here he says that whatever the pleases the, the Almighty shall, shall come to be. The world is a device to please the Almighty. Where is the creator? Pervading water, land, and ether. The creator, indescribable, untouchable, and for whom no end can be found. Only they who behold the one with singular attention are fulfilled. Destruction and creation are the will of the great designer, and whatever pleases the Almighty shall come to be. This world is a device for that. And finally, uh, on the agreement part, Guru Nanak believes that by divine power, the Vedas, the Puranas, and the Katebas come to be. 
The Vedas are the Hindu scriptures that come to us in oral form. The Puranas are Hindu lore that talk about the gods and goddesses of the Hindu tradition. And the Katebs are the scriptures of the West. Um, Guru Nanak has not been to Israel, but he has been to Mecca, and he knows about the gospel. He knows about the Quran. The Quran is all around him in, in Muslim India. He knows about the Psalms, and he knows about the law, the Torah. He definitely knows about these things. And so these are the, the scriptures of the West. By power, wisdom, lore, and scriptures, the reflection on them is also by power. And power here is divine power. So, that could be it. We could say, yeah, we agree, see you later, it's been great. But that's not what academics do. <laughs> we need to find things to argue about. No, we also need to be intellectually responsible and say, it's not so easy, is it? There are things that challenge the way that Heschel lays this out, and maybe these are obstacles to overcome, or maybe these are divine lessons that we need to build on Heschel with. So here, as I said before, the Veda of the, of the Hindus and the Kateba of the Muslims are what, is talking of, what he's talking about here. Sacred wisdom and holy books don't know that one has no mother, no father, no son or brother, that one cr creates and raises mountains while remaining beyond reach. Well, that's interesting. He said in a previous composition that the sacred books come from the one. And here he's saying that the sacred books don't have it. So now we've got to figure out what is he talking about? How could he say both things? Um, here he seems to be criticizing Muslims. And now it's not just Muslims he criticizes. Guru Nanak has a very acerbic tongue. And he criticizes everybody. He criticizes yogis, people who um, practice ascetic renunciation of the body. They get the worst of it. Um, he criticizes Jains uh, for plucking their hair out of their head. Uh, he sees no, no role for that in, in divine worship. And he criticizes a lot of Hindu practices. Here, we see him criticizing something that is relatively close to his way of being religious, which is following a monotheism with a divine revelation, the Quran. Why does he criticize them? He says, at five times you perform your prayers, reading from the Quran, but Nanak says, when the grave calls, your worldly ways will end. What could he mean by that? In my interpretation, what he's saying here is that there is a deeper religiosity that might inspire the five prayers, but the five prayers are not sufficient to contain. So what he might be saying here in the previous slide is that sacred wisdom, maybe it's necessary for some people, but it's not sufficient if they don't have God in their heart. If their hearts are ill-intentioned. If they do uh, something differently than they say they are doing. Intention for Guru Nanak, intentionality is the key for devotion. And one last uh, composition, this I love. You came here naked, says the guy wearing a turban, says the guy, right, whose religious garb is to dress religiously. But Guru Nanak reminds me, hey, you came here naked, took on worldly matters and wrote your destiny. That which is written cannot be erased and the date has been set for your wedding. And the wedding here is the wedding with the Big husband in the sky, death, God. The true one writes in nectar and in poison, and the one writes, so do we reap. A lovely conjurer has slipped her thread of many enticements around your neck. Your weak nature has caused your weak self to eat the fly that sat on the candy. So we've eaten the entire candy. God has provided something really sweet in this world, and we were supposed to eat only the good stuff, but we ate it all, and now we're sick because we didn't discern. Our intention wasn't lined up with the divine. You came with no culture and will be sent off again, naked. The moment of death, the moment of birth, the moment of death. Do we come here with religion? 
When God sees us, does God see a Muslim, a Sikh, an atheist, a humanist, a Hindu? I don't know. Gunanik says we come here naked. So what's the answer? Let me tell you the answer. It's complicated. I believe in the religion of the banyan tree. This is what Bhai Gurdas, the guy who I translate, calls the Sikh tradition. The Sikh tradition ought to be, he says, an orchard of banyan trees across the world for the banyans give cool, deep shade to this burning hot world. And their fruits look like their roots. They're the same through and through. He wants us to be the six, an orchard of banyan trees. What does that mean? He wants us to see us ourselves as part of a larger human family. So my question to us in this world is how big is your us? How big is your we? Is it just your community? And I believe in the religion of helping others. I believe in the religion of service to humankind. That for me is the essence of the Sikh tradition. It is laid out really beautifully in somebody who is an aboriginal activist out of Australia. Didn't know much about Guru Nanak at all. How did that happen? She says, if you came here to help me, you're wasting our time. But if you have come because your liberation is bound up with mine, then let's work together. I believe your liberation is bound up with mine and mine with yours. So I think Heschel is a great start. I think we can build on Heschel. But I think the model of Abrahamic faiths versus Eastern faiths versus, this is not total interfaith cooperation. This is selective interfaith. It was great for 1966 um, for that purpose. But it's not the end because no religion is the end. Heschel himself says that. Religion is a means, not the end. And for my students, some of whom have not been raised with religion by no fault of their own, some of whom have had to reject religion because of some deep pain that religious people have caused them, I can't call them nihilists. I can't say my atheist friends and my humanist friends are nihilists. That is something um, I, I want to talk to Heschel about. Um, people who are humanists have value, right? The Buddhist tradition is an atheistic tradition. I take Dalai Lamas up and down over some of the people in my own faith uh, all day. The question that I want to ask is twofold. Are we humans before we're Muslims or Christians or Catholics? And finally, what is the will of God? Because one of the core teachings of the Sikh tradition that there's, that there's two things in this world. There is that will and there is this will. And the point of life is to cut this out so that we can only be living with that will. But there's a lot of people who will be tricking you up on that one. And so who can say? Guru Nanak himself says that the true leader, somebody who you can trust, whose spiritual teachings you can trust, are the person, is a person who works hard at his or her job and eats based on what he or she has earned, but gives to others from that earning. That person is a spiritual leader. So with that, I want to take tons of questions. We have plenty of time to engage. You got a little bit of introduction to the Sikh tradition, a little bit of my take on Heschel, and thank you so much for having me. Let's, let's, let's have a conversation now.
And while we're thinking, I just want to remind the students in my interreligious dialogue class to remember to sign out on your way out on the yellow sheet over here. <laughs> uh, I can, is there a question? I'm mindful of um, Gandhi and his time when in the Indian subcontinent uh, uh, Hinduism and uh, Islam was certainly not getting along well. They divided up they deported, they immigrated, they moved. Uh, tell us what was happening with Sikhism at that time. That's a really great question. It's a really great question. Um, I'll just say that there's a lot of Sikhs who are critical of Gandhi's stances in those days. Uh, so if you want to get a second perspective on, on Gandhi, uh, there's a lot of Sikhs out there who will give you uh, a different take. Um, what happened with the Sikhs at that time? Well, so let me just take a step back. The creation of Pakistan, to me, it doesn't seem like it was ever supposed to happen. Certainly not, it was certainly not in the way that it ended up happening. Um, scholars have recently been saying that it, the idea was a bargaining chip laid out by the Muslim League, who was perhaps rightfully scared of what it would look, look like for the British to leave and them to, to live in uh, South Asia, uh, an out, a deeply outnumbered minority. A strong minority, an important minority, but an outnumbered minority, deeply outnumbered by the Hindus. Um, it was a it was crazy times, right, in, in the world's history, at the end of the Second World War. Um, nobody knew that the British wanted out, out as fast as they did. But what was happening with the rise of the Labor Party in England after the war is that that exit strategy was accelerated much more than anybody thought was going to happen. The man, who, his name is Radcliffe, who um, drew the final map, never set foot on land in South Asia. He used uh, demography and numbers and a flyover to pick which river was gonna be the dividing line. I mean, it was madness. It's just total madness. Um, it is the most murderous few days in the history of the world, probably, the partition. Uh, six ended up siding with the supposedly secular Indian state, um, hoping, thinking that they were getting a strong federalism in which the Punjab region would be deeply um, independent, almost autonomous, which didn't happen. Um, but in the partition, Sikhs, Hindus, and Muslims uh, raped, killed, butchered each other. And there were no good guys. <laughs> And there were no good things that, that really came out of that. Um, as a Punjabi, some of my favorite poets come from the other side of the border. My guru was born on the other side of the border. Um, the entire Punjab. I mean, th you could say there's a river that runs through most of it, but nothing natural to the social lives of the people? Absolutely not. Yeah. So I, I said, uh, she has a place in India. Thank you so much for just a really great presentation. I uh, wanted to ask you, uh, we're living in a time, as you mentioned, with so much misunderstanding. And I particularly feel very upset about the attacks that the Sikh community has experienced, um, how can we um, explain a martial tradition, uh, you know, of the Sikhs and protect, I mean, I think defend some of their customs and tradition 
and yet reassure people here? Yeah, that's a really great question. It's like carrying a knife, you know, I mean. Uh, yeah, so six, most sick men, uh, most six who are baptized by that ceremony that I briefly mentioned, the Khanda di Poho, um, can not only keep their hair long and uncut as a symbol of um, divine will, but um, also carry a sword on them, which has been reduced in the modern period to a small knife sized thing. There are a lot of people in nonprofits, much smarter than me and much more successful than me, working on those issues uh, in American civil life, in American legal uh, formations that are working deeply on that. Um, as a Sikh in America, I feel pretty confident and able to practice my religion very freely. I am just as concerned, though, about my religiosity as my Muslim student's ability to practice her religiosity, as my dreamer student's ability to not fear being deported right now. Um, as my neighbor's concern about his, the well-being of his family because his job might have been lost. So for me, as somebody who doesn't have to stick his ne neck out in nonprofits that work on these issues and can live a comfortable life as a, as a thinker, but somebody who tries to inspire uh, the next generation of leaders in America, for me, solidarity with other people is the answer. Because if we can create networks of solidarity, we will all be OK. But if people build walls around that and around each other, we will not. Uh, back to the question about Pakistan. During the partition, did uh, the six uh, move into India then? Did they stay in Pakistan? Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't, I didn't answer that question completely. Thank you. Um, Six who were in the West Punjab moved over to the East Punjab. Small numbers stayed and thought that it would work out. There are still some mercantile communities in Pakistan of six. They number in the small thousands. Um, with the rise of the, the Talibanization of certain parts of Pakistan that even Pakistanis themselves are suffering from, uh, you know, Muslim Pakistanis, Shia, Christian Pakistanis, um, their life has been made more and more difficult. Um, but uh, in 1947, most moved over to the east, and there was government schemes to house those refugees and eventually get them settled into lands if they had given up land uh, in the west. But it wasn't able to be equally distributed because what the lands they gave up was far more geographically um, uh, spread out than what, what, what was received in the east from Punjab. But most six moved over to the east. Yeah. And then also, um, well you may have said this earlier, but I, if so, I missed it. Just uh, what exactly was the complaint about the Sikh community against uh, Gandhi? Um, his form of what ended up happening with Gandhi's successor, Nehru, was this kind of secular um, Indian nationalism. Which, which didn't fare well with sort of religious nationalism of six. Um, and also, there, there wasn't this sense that Gandhi really respected the Sikh tradition as an independent, um, you know, great world uh, religion. He subsumed it under Hinduism. A lot, of, a, a, lo a lot of times that happens, and that continues to happen. Um, and that has been, like I said before, the bane of six existence is that, no, we're not Hindus. Yeah, and that's caused a lot of tension um, in the Sikh community. Another question or comment? Anyone? Right here. Yeah, you brought up the point of uh, thinking of yourself as a human first. Like, do you think that would be important for people of all religions? Because you kind of said that solidarity. Like, do you think of yourself as a human first before a Sikh? Or is it kind of so embedded that you think of yourself as a Sikh first and then anything else? Or That's a great question. Um, depends on the day of, uh, when I wake up or what I have for breakfast, I guess. Um, this is the central tension of our time. 
is that we belong to groups and we belong to the larger human family. And how do we hold both? Um, the answer is not easy. I think I can be both and all the time. I'm lucky that I'm born into a relatively non-exclusivist religion. Like, no one, no six are out there being like, you're going to hell. You know, we just don't have the numbers to justify. Like, we would constantly be getting beat up. Um, to, 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 say, to say that, you know, I've also grown up in a minority tradition, which I've always had to explain myself. But, uh, but I th think for myself as a Sikh, it's really easy to be a Sikh and love Islam. It's really easy for me to be a Sikh and say, wow, those Psalms are something else, you know? It's really easy for me to be a Sikh and, and be like, A. Philip Randolph? was a humanist leader who helped set up the March on Washington that birthed the I Have a Dream speech. Wow. Do you know what I mean? Um, I think we need more of that. I know Dr. Gustafsson calls that holy envy, uh, and he's working on a project in that. I think that is the answer, is be who you are and be more expensive than that. One of, the, one of my favorite things that I've been able to do at Cal Lutheran is as campus interfaith strategist, move my Lutheran brothers and sisters to we are Lutheran but we do interfaith, to we are Lutheran and we do interfaith, to we do interfaith because we're Lutheran. And that has been a transformative shift. And now we can get some stuff done. Well, thank you for your talk. I really learned a lot here. from it and look forward to learning more. Thank you, um, Well, in my interfaith work, um, one of the things that um, we've enjoyed doing is uh, celebrating each other's holidays, and um, we try to be sort of creative about it. But I was wondering um, if you could tell us about some of the Sikh holidays and are there, you know, is there one or maybe several that really lend themselves to a lot of interfaith and intercultural sharing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. The biggest one is Diwali, which is happening now and like about a month ago. I mean, it's like a, it just keeps happening. It just, it's, a, it's a long, extensive fall festival. Um, Diwali has been associated with the Hindu tradition really deeply. But what Diwali is to me, uh, it's the same thing as Halloween. It just happens to be at the same time as the fall harvest, right? And uh, I think what we're really celebrating there without, with, by forgetting what the, our agrarian roots was that, oh my God, this earth is bountiful and the harvest is here and it's dark out. Let's light a bunch of lamps and let's celebrate each other and in our land. Uh, what Sikhs have had to do to feel good about celebrating Diwali is create... Um, uh, and, and don't tell any six I said this because they would they would hate <laughs> me. Good thing it's not being videotaped. Is uh, they've created a mythology about Diwali that is related to one of the gurus' lives, and that's why we celebrate it. Um, I would be like, why can't we just celebrate it? Because I love celebrating Christmas, right? Uh, why do we can't we celebrate? Because everybody celebrates it. So Diwali is a great time in Punjab where a lot of people are coming together, um, lighting firecrackers. I remember. Uh, when we were in India at one point, my grandfather just gave my dad, my cousin, like a, just a stack of rupees. And we were just like, we ran and got on our scooters uh, and got a bunch of firecrackers that, that we would, you know, set off sweets. And that would be the biggest interfaith holiday. The Spring Harvest Festival is called Vaisakhi. Uh, and that is the festival that commemorates the elevation of the Sikh community to Khalsa. And that's less of an interfaith festival, necessarily, and more of a Khalsa-centric, Sikh-centric festival. But definitely, that's something where um, Hindus, Muslims, and Sikhs you know, would, have, would have celebrated together in past times. Um, there's one town in the eastern Punjab that is still a Muslim-majority town. There's only one. But in towns like that that are deeply pluralistic, those festivals are all celebrated together. People practice Eid together. People worship Diwali together. And that was something that was part of Punjabi life before the partition that is now alive only in remnants.
Well, oh, one more? Okay, sorry, we took it then from you. Yeah. Well, my husband uh, visited India a few years ago and went to uh, East Punjab, and the group he was with um, was kind enough to take the group to uh, the Golden Temple, and uh, he really got a lot out of that visit and took lots of pictures, and it was very educational. And uh, I'm wondering if you can tell us more about um, the role and place of the Golden Temple in Sikh life and um, maybe what um, a non-Sikh visiting could get out of it. Right. So the Golden Temple is the tourist name for the Darbar Sahib, the holy court that I was talking about earlier in Amritsar. Um, and it is not golden uh, because it needs to be golden. It's golden because it's important. And the first major Sikh ruler uh, plated it with gold as a symbol of his devotion and Sikh ascendancy um, uh, in the early 1800s. Before that, it was still a major center of Sikh life. It um, is a deeply historical place where uh, many of the Sikh gurus uh, lived and, and preached, and today it, it houses a, a complex that I said can be comparable to the Vatican or to uh, Mecca. It is a place of pilgrimage for Sikhs, not necessarily if you don't do this, you're not a good Sikh or you won't go to heaven, but as a place of getting in touch with one's tradition, of asking for something from God that you really, really want, like your son to pass his test or your daughter to get a good job or, you know, those kinds of things. But w one thing that I experience when I go there, and I experience it every time, is just a sense of awe. Uh, it's like, whoa, there's a really big gold building in front of me. That's one thing. But I feel uh, the Muslim tradition talks about barakat and baraka and the Sufis. I feel there's some holiness that emanates from that place that is um, indescribable to me. And the only sociological explanation that I can give is that there's a lot of people out there who are feeling they're in some holy place, they're acting differently, they're serving, people are constantly cleaning. There's a you know, lunger that is feeding 20,000 people a day with no money asked for. People can come five meals a day if they want there, they'll feed you, uh, until you're full, I call six the Italian grandmothers of the world religions. And so all of, and they will house you, you know, if you need. So all of these things contribute to a really um, I I immense feeling of holiness for me there. And a lot of six and non six who go there feel the same way. And it's open to people of all religions. In fact, the architecture is set up so that you have to go down into the, the, the Gurdwara to um, to get into it, which means you have to bow yourself. Uh, no, you don't have to literally bow, but you step down into steps as a symbol of humility. Water going to the lowest place, and the gurdwara itself has four doors for each direction, uh, welcoming people from all uh, walks of life to that place. So there's something special about it. Thank you. Well, there was something special about your presentation and you, this session, and on behalf of my colleague Hans Gustafsson and the community here, I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for joining us in this project and for not only being so instructive but so enlightening. Thank, thank you. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you all for saying <laughs> Appreciate it.